Well, praise you. Good to see you in church this morning. Everybody doing well? Amen. Everyone doing well? Good to see you, brother. Brother, brother and sister Pinella are with us. Their daughter. That's a good day. And all you folks are here. That's right. Praise God. You excited to be here? Amen. Okay. I'm going to be reading from uh, the book of Romans, chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, if you will turn there with me. Romans 8, beginning at the first verse. We'll read to verse 11. All right, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. <clears throat> you know this. Most of you can quote it verbatim. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. The title of my message this morning is Mind Maintenance. Mind Maintenance. What I'm about to share with you this morning is nothing new. I've preached and taught on this um, for all the time I've been here and times before, and I'm sure Pastor Fegler did, and many preachers and teachers have taught on this subject. It's nothing new. I'm sure we all know this. But there are some things for which we should be reminded. Amen? Some things that it doesn't hurt us to be reminded of. And uh, Paul tells us that, uh, in, as he writes to the church at Corinth, he says that we, we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. We are new creations. He said, the old is gone. What we were before coming to Christ, that is, if we've come to Christ, right? We've come to Him, we've acknowledged Him as Lord and Savior, uh, we have the saving knowledge of Christ, we've been born again, then our lives in the past, our, our old nature, our sinful life is gone. That's behind us. And we are new creatures, new creations. And, and this life we now live, we live in and by the presence and power of the indwelling Spirit of God. Amen. Now, Jesus had a conversation with a Pharisee named Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to him, asked him some questions about eternal life, about the kingdom of God, and and Jesus shared with him this very thing. He says, you, you must be born again. You must be born again because flesh, this, this, this body, this, this nature, humanity, gives birth to humanity. Flesh gives birth to flesh. But only the Spirit of God can give spiritual birth and, and can make you alive spiritually. So you must be born again, born of the Spirit of God. Now... Now, now that we have been born again by the Spirit of God and His Spirit dwells within us as believers, now we must walk in the Spirit. We have to walk in the Spirit. And friends, that has never been more important than it is today. 
that we walk in the Spirit of God, that, that we walk discerning. Um, listen, God gave us a great deal of instruction, and in fact, a good portion of our New Testament instruction was given to us through the teachings of the Apostle Paul. So we're going to look at a few things. I already, I already read from Romans and then I, I quoted uh, Corinthians. We're, we're going to look at some of the things that Paul said all in the proper context and, and uh, all in the proper context of Romans chapter 8. Now we're very familiar with the 8th chapter of Romans. Right? There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, um, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. We know that. But this chapter 8 follows. What, what Paul is saying there, he's following chapter 7. You know, and you say, duh, right? You know, 8 follows 7, Pastor. We got that. But in chapter 7... Paul was addressing a life of religion. He's saying, we're, we're no longer under condemnation. Uh, you know, we're, we're not walking in the flesh, we're walking in the spirit. And, um, and, and he's addressing a, a life of religion. And this is where many people live. Many people live a life of religion. Now, I know that there are a great percentage, a great percentage of the world, uh, unfortunately, are atheists. There's a percentage, unfortunately it's a, it's a pretty big number, of people that are atheists or agnostics. They don't, they don't have any religion. They don't follow anything. They don't believe anything um, in, uh, by, by, by the way of religion. But there's a greater percentage of people um, in the world, most people in the world have a, have a, a, a religious um, upbringing. A greater percentage of religious people having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Now, I know that there, there, there are those that are raised in a system of religious teachings, and that, that is very, a very broad spectrum. You know, I was raised Catholic. I'm sure many of you were uh, Catholic, or whether you were raised Catholic, or whether you were raised Episcopalian, or whether you were raised um, Jehovah's Witness, or, or Buddhists, or Islam, or whatever else. Most people in the world were raised under some religious system of belief. You with me? Amen. Now Paul is addressing the Old Testament law. He's addressing the Jews who were very religious, who had, who had been raised under this religious system, Judaism, the Old Testament, the law, and he's addressing them. And, um, and we hear Paul rejoicing that we are no longer under the law, but now we are under grace. He says that in Romans 6, verse 14. We're no longer under the law, we're now under grace. And, and the church rejoices in that, right? Everybody rejoice for grace. Amen. Amen. We love, we, we're so grateful for amazing grace, unmerited favor, and we rejoice. But, but, but listen, the law, the only thing, the, the law brought the awareness of sin. Paul says, I didn't know I was a sinner until the law told me, don't do this and don't do that. And then I realized, hey man, I'm breaking the law. So what the law can do is it brings the awareness of sin, but that's all it could do. So the Jews growing up under this system, all they, they're being reminded again and again of their sin and that only through a sacrifice could it be covered, but it can never be removed. And all they knew was that they were, all, all the law could do is bring us face to face with our own guilt and, and, and our own sin. And even trying to live by the Ten Commandments Proves to be um, difficult. <laughs> Can I just say that? I, I, I wrote in my notes an exercise in futility, but I don't want to. I don't want to say that because because God says it's possible. It just probably isn't. It's just not probable. You with me? And so so the law tells us that so that we're sinners. And and Paul here in our text he says that the law was weak. Right? So, praise God, we're no longer under the law. We're now under grace. Praise God for grace. And Paul says, but the law was weak. Now, let's look at the context. What was he actually saying? You going to stay with me on this? Amen. What was he actually saying? Listen, look at the context. The law itself 
was not weak. In fact, the law is perfect. God's law, the Old Testament, is perfect. It comes from Him. It comes from a perfect God. Listen, the law is the holy standard from God Himself. God says, this is my law. If you want to have fellowship with me, you need to keep this law perfectly. The law is God's holy standard. It's, it's not weak. It's not bad. In fact, Paul says the law is good. Listen, Romans 7 verse 12, uh, 12, he says, Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. And writing to Timothy, he says, But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. You getting this? Yes. Right. So we're so excited that we're no longer under the law, but the law was good. Paul says, but it was weak. Well, listen, the weakness is not the law itself. The weakness is our flesh. That's right. He says the law was weak in the flesh or through the flesh. You with me? Yes. The law, there's nothing wrong with the law. It's perfect. Problem is with us. Listen, I told some folks that there was going to be a garbage disposal illustration and here it is. I don't know who I was talking to last week. <laughs> Pardon that. It's just stuff slips out. So a few months ago, I replaced my garbage disposal. It just quit. It just stopped working. So I get up underneath the sink with my little test light. And, uh, you know, I'm checking for power. And, and there's a junction box under. I wired the thing myself, so I know where it is. The junction box right there. And I, and I put my, my little test light on it. And it's beeping and flashing. I got power. But the garbage disposal still won't work. Now, my troubleshooting skills leave a, all, a lot to be desired. Uh, but I didn't want to spend time you know, underneath the sink. So I went out and bought a new garbage disposal. And I installed it. There's a whole other story there. You know you've got to remove the plug that goes to your dishwasher or your dishwasher's not going to work. You find that out after you install it. But anyway, I digress. So. So the thing still won't work. It's a, brand new, it's a brand new garbage disposal and it won't work. I've got power at the source and I've got a brand new unit, but it, but it won't work. The problem was not the power source and the problem was not the unit or the device. You know what the problem was? Faulty wiring. Uh, a wire nut had come loose in the junction box and there wasn't a good contact and, uh, and I had power and the unit was okay, um, but, there, but it was faulty wiring. And the problem for us is not the law, the law is perfect. And it's not even the vessel, God's created us in, the image, in, in His image. The problem is faulty wiring. <laughs> right? We're, 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 not, we're not connecting. There's, there's a problem here and it's, and it's faulty wiring. Listen, the problem is not the law, it's faulty wiring in us. Let's carry the analogy a little further. By the way, a jumper would have fixed that. A jumper, you know, it's a wire from the, from the source to the unit. I would have bypassed the faulty wiring and everything would have been okay. And friends, that's what Jesus has done for us. He, he if you will allow me, he completed the circuit by bypassing our wiring. And he made the connection between the Father and us. Amen. Now, friends, we are walking in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit versus walking in the flesh. Are you still with me? Amen. You going to give me five more minutes? Amen. Amen. Do I hear 10? 15? 20. 20. I need 20. Thank you. I'll take that. All in favor, say aye. Okay. Aye. All opposed, go home. <laughs> walking in the Spirit versus walking in the flesh. Now, walking in the flesh, Paul says if we walk in the flesh, we're minding the things of the flesh. Okay? Now, I'm going to go through some things here. i make a comparison. What, so, uh, what is the span? If we're walking in the flesh, what is the span of that walk? Well, the Bible says 70, 80 years. Uh, maybe 90, perhaps 100. I know some people who have lived to be over 100. What is it? Uh, Fern uh, just passed away last month when she was 106, 107 years old. 
So in all that time, however long you're, you're spent, 106, 107, we say, wow, that, that's quite a, a lifespan. But, you know, it, it's a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. But so our lifespan, uh, we're walking in, in the flesh. So, in, so, we, so we, we, we plan for our retirement and we, you know, we, we buy homes and we, we make sure that we have all the stuff that we need and we're, we're planning for our golden years and our retirement years and then you know, ultimately you know, we leave this life after a hey, hundred years. That's the entire span of our life. What's the location of walking in the flesh? When I say walking in the flesh, walking in our, our human nature. What's the location? Planet Earth, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you're an astronaut. <laughs> our, our walk is here on planet Earth. Now, you know, there, there may be one town or one city or, or even a state or even a country that's better or more suitable to your, you know, your lifestyle than another. And so people move to find a better town, a better state, even a better country. But no matter what state, or no matter what nation you live in, it's still planet Earth. You with me? That's right. yes. and, and with all of its disease and all of its taxes and, uh, and all of the aggravation that, that comes with that and, and all of the wars and, and, uh, and, and all of the, uh, everything that comes with, with living in this world, the, the, the uh, um, heartache and, and death and disease and everything else. What's the consideration? What are we concerned with when we're walking in the flesh for this lifespan? Well, we're, we're concerned with the here and now. Walking in the flesh, that is. We're concerned with temporal or, or immediate gratification. We're trying to please our, ourselves and make life comfortable. And, and, we're, and we're trying to enjoy uh, this temporal life. And all of these things influence our thoughts, they influence our feelings, our understanding, and our decisions. You still with me? Amen. Walking in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Now walking in the spirit, listen, um, Paul says that we, if we're walking in the spirit, we do mind the things of the spirit. Mm -hmm. What's the span? Right? Walking in the flesh, 70, 80, 100 years. What's the span of walking in the Spirit? It's eternal. We are eternal beings. We are spiritual, born by the Spirit of God. And walking in the Spirit is for eternity. And listen, we're, we're all going to exist somewhere forever. The question is where will that be? And so the location of our walk in the Spirit is, uh, is heaven. That's right. Heavenly. Listen, Paul said that we are blessed, that God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We are blessed right now in heavenly places. In fact, he says that we are seated. Christ has seated us in heavenly places. We belong to heaven. We are eternal heavenly beings. We are part of the kingdom of God, the eternal kingdom of God. Amen. Hallelujah. What are the considerations? What do we concern ourselves with in our walking in the Spirit? We are concerned with the will of God. We are, we are motivated and consider the, the inner witness of that Spirit of God that dwells within us. The direction and influence of the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen. That's our consideration. Amen. Those are our concerns. Now see, these are two completely different mindsets, are they not? Amen. Two completely different mindsets. Listen, uh, one is walking in obedience to God, and the other is walking in rebellion. That's right. And the Bible says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Might as well go get a broom and a black hat. Because if you're, if you're walking in rebellion, then, you, then you're sinning just as if you were a witch. And notice, there are only two options. Right. You are either walking in the flesh, temporal, worldly, 
or you are walking in the Spirit eternal, uh, and there is no third rail. There's no third option. There's no middle ground. You either are or you aren't. Listen, and Paul says that those who are walking in the flesh cannot please God. Can't. Can't please God. Now, living according to any law requires two things. It requires a lot of things, but basically two things. If you're going to live according to any law, you have to submit to the law, and then you have to obey. Right? Or you're not, or you're not living according to the law. You're living contrary to the law. So there are two things. In order to live according to the law, any law, you submit to it, and then you obey it. Now, Paul says, he talks about two walks and he talks about two laws. The law of sin and death. Now, we were born under the law of sin and death. And we submitted to it by default. You were born in sin. And, uh, you know, the first thing you said to your, you know, the first thing you said was mama and dad, dad. The next word out of your mouth was no. <laughs> <laughs> I rest my cake. <laughs> right? So we were born under the law of sin and death, and we, by default, but we obey that law by choice. Mm -hmm. Up until the point we came to Christ and acknowledged his lordship over us, we walked in disobedience by choice, maybe by ignorance, but by choice nonetheless. So the law of sin and death. And, and, uh, and listen, no effort is required. You, you're born, there's no effort required to walk under the law of sin and death. And we accepted it. And we accept it. That's life. And, and in that, under that law, every temptation is accepted. You still with me? Amen. Every temptation is accepted as a need that must be satisfied. If I'm walking in the flesh, I have no consideration for God or what He wants. All I'm concerned with is the temporal, the here and the now, my self-gratification, and every temptation that comes my way, that's a need that I have to fulfill. And every indulgence, I, I have to carry it through because I'm, 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 I want what I want. I'm living according to the flesh. Listen. Uh, those... Uh, and, 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 so, and so we live, you know, because you only live once, get it while you can, get it all, grab it all, make sure you, you know, you, you get what you need to get. And those in the flesh walk according to natural instincts. So does my dog. <laughs> We're walking in the flesh, it's, it's, the, it's the instant gratification it's the temporal gratification and Paul says that they are carnally minded now the mind is the control center of our lives it's where we make decisions we decide what we are going to wear I I had a hard time this morning because I'm colorblind I think it's okay <laughs> But we make this, I made a decision. I'll, I'll wear, and you made a decision. And, and uh, our minds is where we make our decisions, right? It's, it's, where we, it's where we decide. It's where we think, where we reason, where we believe. And so we live according to what we think. Still there? Yeah. We live according to what we think. We are governed by our five senses, empirical senses. You know, I'm hungry, and so I eat. You know, I'm tired, and so we, we go and we rest. I'm cold, so we cover ourselves. We, we feel something, and, and so we react to how we feel, what we think, we make decisions upon, upon all this. You know, are you familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs? I'll go through this real quick for those of you who are still awake. It's not coffee, it's water. I love water. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, there's five, I'll, I'll just go quickly. Physiological need, he says our basic need, basic human need. We need air, food, water, shelter, clothing, sleep. Right? Those are the 
physiological needs. Every human being has this. Uh, the need for safety and security. That includes uh, our concern about our health, employment, possessions. Uh, there's a need for love and belonging. So we have family and friends. There's intimacy and connection that we long for. There's a need for self-esteem, which includes confidence, achievement, respect. We all have a, a need, a longing for those things. And then self-actualization, which includes morality, creativity, spontaneity, acceptance, purpose, meaning, inner potential. Those, the, Maslow says that these are the basic human needs. The, the fle for those who are going to walk in the flesh, these are the things that you're going to need. That's just basic humanity. And I suppose that that would be okay if this is all there is. If this life is all there is, then those things are abundantly important, uh, immensely important. You, you, of course you would live for those things. Uh, uh, you know, if, if all there is is a lifetime on earth, yes, I'm going to be concerned with my, my comfort and my safety and, and, uh, and intimacy and all of those things. Listen, are you familiar with Rene Descartes, the name of that philosopher, Rene Descartes? One of the most famous of all the philosophers, perhaps. Well, maybe he's not. He is to me anyway. Rene Descartes set out in his, in his quest to find meaning in life, to understand existence. You know, listen, we all exist, right? You exist. But, you know, Rene Descartes, you know, he was concerned. I don't know exactly what he was concerned with, but something like this. You know, how do we know that Earth isn't a grain of sand under some giant's fingernail? We're, we're, we're talking about philosophy now. So, some phys so he's looking, he's, he wants to know the meaning of life, and, and, and is, is this really me? I mean, am I, am I, really, am, am, am I just, am I really here, or, or is, there, is there something else going on? And he, and he concluded with this, he said, I think, therefore I am. Now, I may not be what I think I am. I may not be what I, what I appear to be in the mirror. I don't know. But, but I know I exist because I could think. And my thought tells me that I am real. <coughs> you with me on that? I think. And if I think, then I, I exist. So I don't know what my existence truly is, but, but I think. Well, here's a problem with that argument. I know an awful lot of people that don't think at all, and they still are. So that falls apart. And with that reasoning, or with any human reasoning, listen, you may just be somebody else's dream. Your whole life right now is just somebody else dreaming. And when they wake up, you're gone. How do you know that's not true? See, I'm just saying, these are, the, this, these are the thoughts, this is what, uh, you know, so, so we have no real purpose in life. So we're born, and we live, and we survive, and we die. We're just walking in the flesh, we're just getting through 70, 80 years. But those who are born of the Spirit are governed by a much higher understanding. Amen. Listen, our lives are not temporal, it's not just here and now. We're not guided by our five senses. We have an eternal purpose. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus <coughs> requires that we submit and obey. Amen. Right? You're going to walk according to the law. You have to submit and you have to obey. So the carnal, Paul says the carnal, unregenerate person cannot receive this cannot receive the truth, cannot receive... Listen, he says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Listen, I'm talking to the church this morning. If you have not surrendered everything at the feet of Jesus, you cannot please him. Listen, I didn't say you weren't saved. And I'll look at that perhaps next week. I didn't say you weren't saved. 
I'm just saying, if you have not surrendered everything at the feet of Jesus, you cannot please Him. You cannot hear His Spirit's voice. You cannot follow Him or do His will. You first need to confess to God that you are completely lost without Him. Acknowledge that only through faith in Jesus, His death and resurrection, can you be saved from the judgment to come. You cannot, otherwise, walk in the Spirit. You cannot please God. You cannot have the peace that passes our understanding. And you cannot have real, eternal hope. Because, it, because if you're walking in the flesh, you have rejected the only means by which to receive the things of God. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? You have rejected the Spirit of God. You're not listening to Him. You can't hear Him. Therefore, you can't submit and obey. The battleground is the mind. Now listen, I'm not talking about mind over matter. This isn't positive thinking or positive confession. Or as we, you know, flippantly uh, remark, um, you know, blab it and grab it. You know, name it and claim it. Uh, pus uh, uh, Confess it and possess it. Listen, you can't make, you can't talk yourself into walking in the Spirit. You can't talk yourself into being a godly person. You can't wish or think, uh, you know, good things to, to come. It doesn't come, it doesn't happen that way. It's not mind over matter, I'm going to make things happen because I'm going to think positively. That's nonsense. That's heresy. You hear me? That's heresy. I'm not talking about mind over matter. But Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, he said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. Paul says, don't be conformed to the world. Conformity. Conformity. Um, and Philip's uh, translation, or he, he, in the, his translation says, don't let the world force you into its mold. Don't, don't, don't be conformed. Don't, don't, um, don't get stuck in the rut. Don't follow the crowd. It's not mob mentality. Don't, don't allow the forces and influence of this world to, to uh, influence you. Don't, don't conform. Don't be like the world. Listen, he also, um, in this context, he's talking about an outward conformity to religious expression. Don't be conformed to the world, but also don't be conformed to any religious uh, expression. He said, but rather be transformed. Transformed. And the word he uses is metamorphuo in the Greek, which is where we get the word metamorphosis. So you have a, a caterpillar or a worm. Uh, a caterpillar, uh, let's, let's say he's, let's name him Fred. So you got Fred who's a caterpillar. And he crawls along and he, and he, and he spins himself a chrysalis or chrysalis, however you want to, I don't know. A chrysalis, chrysalis a cocoon, he spins himself that cocoon and, 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 and he sits there and, and while he's in there, uh, nobody can see him, he's under the veil of this thing, he's being transformed completely. Now when Fred comes out, he's still Fred. Hey Fred, yeah, he'll say yes. But, um, but he's not the caterpillar he was, he's now a beautiful butterfly. He's, he's the same person, but a completely different creature. Amen? So Paul says, don't, don't be conformed to the world under the law of sin and death, walking in the flesh, minding the things of the flesh, but rather be ye transformed, be ye recreated. And he says it, and he tells us how to do this. Listen, this is a spiritual phenomenon that takes place in the true believer. Going against the flow is not natural. 
It requires effort on our part. Hey, it's coming at us, right? And we're going the other way. Everybody's telling us, follow me. And we're saying, no, you're wrong. And, and, and going against the flow is not an easy thing. It requires effort on our part. Renewing one's mind is not just making yourself think different thoughts. You're not just going to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to not think this. I'm going to start thinking these things. And, and listen, it is surrendering to the influence of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me on this? Amen. This is Paul's telling us. He's saying, don't be conformed. Be transformed. And this is how you're going to renew your mind. And renewing your mind is surrendering to the influence of the Holy Spirit. And this, by the way, friends, is a very real thing that happened. You know, you know, I've seen people change their religions. They go from Pentecostal to Roman Catholic. How in the world did you do that? How did you make that jump? How did you... How did, or, or, or from Christianity, I knew a guy who, who claimed to be a Christian and then he changed his religion to, a Buddha, to Buddhism. How, how you, you can't... Listen, you can't change your religion into being born again. It, it doesn't come that way. It's not, it's not your own thought process. Listen, a very real transformation takes place when we acknowledge Christ and we're born of the Spirit of God. Listen, if we think that we're the ones who have to find appropriate thoughts, then think them, we will be defeated all the time because that's self-reliance. That's, I have to figure out what I'm supposed to think and then I'm going to think it. You still with me? Yes. yes. Yeah. We must stop, and I'm getting close to the end here. We must stop the earthly, negative, critical, sensual thoughts. And Paul tells us, he actually instructs us as to how. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. Paul says, casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. And bringing it into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Let's start with verse 3 of this text. He says, um, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now, let me correct something here. Uh, Paul, here in this context, Paul's not talking about walking in carnality. He's simply saying as we walk in humanity. He said in, a, in, our, in our human walk, we, we, we're not warring after the flesh. Our battle is not with flesh and blood. Uh, listen, he goes on to say, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The, listen, the many thoughts that enter our minds daily Paul is saying we must take captive and bring them into obedience. Mm -hmm. Listen, um, our minds are to our spirits what our livers are to our bodies. Now, I, I don't th even think I ever took biology. If so, I slept through it because I don't remember. I'm not, I'm not really good with the human body <coughs> biologically. But let me tell you this. I, from the best of my understanding... And just go with me on the illustration. Um, our minds are to our spirits what our livers are to our bodies. Now, our, our livers take what we ingest and filter it. Am I right, medical field? So whatever you eat, you eat all kinds of junk. Right? We eat all kinds of junk. Somebody, I read something on, online the other day. It says, we no longer eat food. We eat food-like products. Monosodium glutamate. Propylene glycol. You know what propylene glycol is? Antifreeze. That's in your food. You know how to make antifreeze? Take away your afghan. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did I lose the anointing? No. But you look at all the stuff that you, we eat stuff that we can't even pronounce. We can't spell it. It's all... And, and, and so your body, you, that comes in and your stomach breaks it down and starts to send it off and your, and your liver says, nope, that's, that's poison. I got to take that out. I can't let that become part of your bloodstream. I can't let that become part of your being. That, 
this poison that you're eating, if I just let it go, it's going to go into your system. It's going to become part of you. You are what you eat. And so the liver says, no, I'm going to, I'm going to arrest that. I'm going to bring it into captivity, and out it goes as waste. It's, I'm not going to let it in. And, and here, friends, is, is what I'm trying to say. Our minds need to process what we consume. Our eyes and our ears, what we hear, what we see, all this stuff that's coming at us. Our minds need to process, process and, and everything, regardless of the source, everything that challenges the truth of what God's Word says must be arrested and locked up. A thought comes and you know, that's not God. That's not the Word of God. I can't. No, you're, you, you, you must take your, take, by the Spirit of God that dwells within, I'm taking that thought captive. You're, you're not getting it. I'm not going to dwell on this thought. I'm going to filter it out and it's going out as waste. I'm not going to allow these thoughts to become a part of me. Amen. I'm not going to let these things, you know, listen. Uh, these are lies spun by the father of lies. I'm not letting this thought uh, affect me. I will not absorb them and allow them to make me spiritually ill. <clears throat> or like in guard duty, we used to say when somebody would approach our guard, our post, halt! Who goes there? Let me see your credentials. I don't trust you. I want to know who sent you. I want to know if you come as a help or a hindrance. And Ed, when those thoughts come at us, whatever they may be, you've got to stop and say, wait a minute, did this thought, is this thought coming from the lover of my soul? If I embrace this thought and I act upon this thought, is it going to make me stronger? Is it going to make me, uh, uh, is it going to draw me closer to God? Is it going to help me or is it going to hurt me? Did this come from the lover of my soul or from the enemy of my soul? And if, you, if there's any question, you take that thought captive and say, not today. I'm not going to think this thought. I'm, instead, instead, I'm going to begin to thank and praise and worship God. Amen. This is, right. You want to know how to renew your mind? So that you aren't conforming to the world, but being transformed. You want to know how you're no longer walking according to the law of, the, uh, uh, of sin and death? Then when, when you're, as a child of God, when, when any thoughts that are negative, and they say, you're not what God wants you to be. Well, wait a minute, I know that's absolutely true, but totally irrelevant. That's not coming from the lover of my soul. God's not going to beat me up. Uh, he may bring conviction. Conviction is wonderful, but condemnation is not of God. And so if these thoughts come and they're condemning, I know that's not coming from God. Nope, you're, I'm not going to think about that. Instead, I'm going to praise God for His mercy. I'm going to praise God for His forgiveness. I'm going to begin to quote Scripture that tells me that I'm a child of God. I have received the spirit of adoption whereby I cry, Abba, Father. Oh, yeah. Father, I worship you and I thank And begin to praise Him and thank Him for His goodness. Amen. Like water that flushes out the liver, so praise and worship flush out the mind. Amen. Meditating and quoting the Word of God will renew the mind. Amen. This also reminds us of who it is we serve. This is my conclusion. Paul, writing to the church of Philippi, you know, if we're talking about the mind, you, you're probably waiting for this scripture to come up. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 9, Paul says, Be careful or anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, and if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Listen, friends, anxiety often comes when we listen to the lies. Mm -hmm. 
We, we embrace the thought, we entertain the thought, and we listen to it, and now we're in trouble. Now we're anxious, now we're worried. And we fall back to carnal thinking. Oh no, what do I do now? And we react to what we see and hear. But in thankful, faith-filled prayer, God's peace comes to us. In everything we pray, and we're thankful to God, and in, and, and, and in everything, in thankful, faith-filled prayer, God's peace comes to us. Then we can think on these things. Amen. Listen, Paul said, all of creation groans. We who have the first fruits of the Spirit have a taste of heaven. Paul says all creation is groaning, just waiting for our full redemption. Mm -hmm. Right? And listen, we, um, we who have the first fruits, who have been born again, who have the indwelling Spirit of God, um, we, we have tasted of heaven. And so we are spoiled for this world. Listen to me. If you have tasted of heaven, you can never be happy here again. If you have met the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have been born again, if, if He has touched you and, and, and given you new birth, then this world will never satisfy you, no matter what. You'll never be happy. If you, if you left and walked away from God, you'd be miserable the rest of your life because you have tasted of God and uh, you'll never be the same again. My, my, my final thing, a weak, a weak illustration, but um, it's all I have. Now, I've tasted of crawfish etouffee. Let me tell you, no, no. Not just have I tasted of crawfish etouffee, but I lived in Louisiana and ate crawfish etouffee by a Cajun chef. I'm just trying to tell you, there's nothing better than that. I mean, you, you can't compare anything to etouffee made in Louisiana by a Cajun chef. I've tried, I've been in many other places and I've tried uh, their etouffee, but I'm always disappointed. I could, they all come up short. I have resolved the, to the fact that I will never again taste really true um, uh, Louisiana crawfish etouffee. Right? This, I, I've, it, and I have tasted of the kingdom of God. I have tasted of the spirit of God. I have tasted of the Lord and I have seen that he is good. And nothing in this world can ever satisfy me. Nothing. Friends, if you have tasted of the Lord, nothing in this world will ever compare to what you have. So Paul says, we're not, we don't walk according to the flesh. We don't walk according to the here and now, to the temporal things. We're not concerned with just gratifying our immediate uh, desires and itches. Uh, our, our focus is beyond the 70, 80, 100 years. We, we are eternal. We are born of the Spirit of God. Our, our minds are not carnal. We're, we're not influenced by the things of the world. We're influenced and directed by the indwelling Spirit of the living God who has given us new birth, who guides our steps. We are to walk in the Spirit. And if we do, we won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. And when, when the enemy comes against us to, to cause us or try to get us to conform, no, we, uh, we have a, the power of the Spirit. We're, we're not walking under that law anymore. We, we're, we don't live according to the law of sin and death. We're living according to the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Amen. And we're walking in the Spirit of God. And we could take every thought that comes against us and against our faith in God and we could bring it into captivity and we can live in victory. Amen. 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 Lord, I thank you for your word this morning. I pray, God, that uh, beyond and in spite of my weakness and my failed attempts at humor, people hear the word of God. Lord, all that matters is that we hear and that we submit and obey. Yes, yes. But God, I thank you that we are no longer under the law. The law is good, but Lord, it, it only showed us how bad we were. Mm -hmm. But you sent your son to bypass it, to fulfill, to make the connection between the Father and us. And, uh, and now, Lord, through him, we, we have the inner dwelling of the Spirit of God. 
We, we do cry, Abba, Father. We hear your voice. We know, Lord, you, we discern your truth and your will. So I pray, God, that you will help us to walk in your spirit so that we won't do what you don't want us to do, but that we will fulfill your will for us. And Lord, if there is somebody here or somebody listening that doesn't know you, Father, they are, they are walking in the flesh by default. Lord, they, they're born into this world. They've never known you, God. They've never experienced the, the new birth. They've never known what it is to have peace that passes understanding. They live in anxiety, Lord. They live in fear. But, Lord, something that's been said will cause them to, to think and realize, Lord God, that, that there is something far greater that lies ahead. Uh, an eternal life guided by the Spirit of God, provided by Christ. Lord, I pray that, that, that people will hear and they'll receive and they'll act upon this. But Lord, I pray for each of us that we would, that we would truly walk in a pleasing manner. Um, help us, Lord God, to renew our minds. And I pray these things for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. God is good. Amen. Sing one more song before we leave. Yes. Okay, this is uh, iPad. <laughs>